next, we have an opportunity to hear from our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Rahul Daig, who is a lead product manager at PayPal. And so Rahul will be talking to us today about, um, about some API development. Um, and so Rahul, when you welcome to the stage and, and thank you. Cool, well, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, hi everyone, my name is Rahul. I'm currently at PayPal where I manage their developer products, APIs, SDKs that are focused on uh, payment processing. I've been working at the intersection of uh, developer API, uh, developer experience, APIs, uh, SDKs, and fintechs for a number of years now, and have uh, taken multiple products from zero to one. The talk uh, I'm going to give here today is really a one particular element of that process, which I think is very important when it comes to launching a product that ultimately delivers on, on why you even began doing it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, as, as I was thinking about the title for this talk, uh, the title gives a lot of it away. Uh, but, you know, what I'm going to share with you is some of the mistakes uh, we have done in the process, uh, things that we have learned uh, using this technique. Uh, so it's a lot more about how could you put it in practice and less about the technique itself, which probably is uh, pretty obvious from uh, the title itself. So with that, uh, let's just dig, dig right in. So if, if you've been in, uh, attending one of these conferences for the last couple of years, uh, you know, the code first was this design first is sort of an age old topic. I, I believe you know, even a couple of years from now, we would still debate it as we have been for the last uh, four or five years. Uh, here's a picture I picked up from uh, an article that Swagger wrote a couple of years ago. And, and really what it illustrates is, you know, like with most products, right? You start out with uh, your opportunity, you, you put it in a six pager or your requirement top or a business case, whatever your company is, uh, use this on a day to day basis. And then when it comes to actually making it real, um, you have a choice uh, that most uh, typically choose. One is you, know, you start with the design or you start with the code and then end with uh, a spec. Um, and so, you know, different companies adopt different approaches. Clearly, uh, you know, for a long time, I was um, in, in the camp of getting design first and then coding your APIs. What I've also seen happen in practice is really the code and the spec go hand in hand uh, to a point where, you know, at the end you somehow meet, right? And this typically happens because, you know, let's say you have a team of, seven, eight engineers, and this is sort of the only thing you're doing, you cannot get all of those eight folks to work on the spec. So, you know, the team sort of splits into half or uh, a quarter and three quarters, and then some people work on the code and some people work on the contract, and they somehow meet uh, two or three months down the line. Uh, you know, it's, it's every company sort of adapts to it. Um, but the point that I wanted to make today is, this is, this is how most people do things. And I think this is completely fine. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, some of the things that it does help uh, simplify a bit because you, know, you sort of have a, you could do a lot more mocks, you could have a lot more clarity on what the end goal is going to be. But I think it, it misses a very key element, uh, which is how do you think of something end to end? And how do you sort of imagine all these different APIs coming together to solve a customer problem? So these techniques are really great. I think in my opinion, when you have one API, a single endpoint, and, and you're trying to build it up, but if once you have multiple endpoints, I think the docs driven development really helps a whole lot. And with that, why don't I just introduce you to it and, and talk about what is it? So when I talk about a docs driven development, what I'm really encouraging you guys is to think about the docs first, right? And when I say docs, what I really mean are an integration guide or a user manual or user guide, whatever uh, name you call it with, uh, but with a view of um, uh, end developer in mind. So imagine you know, you're building a, a product um, or you're trying to solve a customer pain point and that means that uh, a developer who's using your product needs to interact with a couple of different APIs. You know, it could be an identity API, it could be your API, and it could be some other team's API. 
what I would want you to think about is imagine that integration and document, document it as you would document uh, towards the end of the program, right? So what I'm encouraging you here is, you know, think of a, uh, you know, a low fidelity integration guide upfront, and then use that to sort of drive your contract definitions and finally to code. Uh, it's, it's very different than how most people do things, which is they start with code, they start with the spec, they then move on to code, and then they finally, you know, scramble to get an integration guide written. Uh, the technique here is really do it, um, you know, starting with the guide first. Um, the rest of the steps are pretty much very similar. Right? So once you have sort of a high level doc in mind and you can imagine explaining to someone what an end-to-end -end integration would look like, you can then go deeper into each one of those steps and then uh, figure out what is the spec going to be, what's the endpoint going to be uh, in much more detail, finally getting to a point uh, where you code your API, right? And so that's, that's sort of the overall technique. Now, some of the potential benefits that I see in, in doing this is one, it, it, it serves as a continuous reminder of what product you're building for, right? Because you are really building with a developer in mind and he or she needs to do something, right? Either accept payments or get data or, or something that adds a business value. And a lot of times it's not just your team's API that's in play, it's multiple teams API in play or even if it's just your API, it needs to play well with some of the other APIs that your company offers, right? So it, it reminds you continuously as you're writing the doc, who is it that you're building for? Why is it that you're building? It also provides a more end-to-end -end integration perspective, right from um, you know the time you get your access token to make your first API call. I have seen docs written which start from developer onboarding to your site all the way to doing something that adds commercial business value. Uh, the other thing that it does really well is if you work for a large company where a lot of work goes, happens in silos, everyone does their job and they finally come together at the end and then go through this exercise of integration uh, testing. I think this sort of simplifies it greatly because you start with uh, almost thinking about how that end-to-end -end integration would look like documented and then each team could go work on their own step and then come back to the table. Uh, it also helps uh, in competitive analysis, right? So let's say you already have an API, it's fallen behind the curve, you launch something new, and then what, what are you going to compare it against, right? When you think about APIs, really docs is such a big part of your product, you know, having an integration guide allows you to compare what the end result might be uh, with what your competitor already offers. And then you already have opportunities to compare the two and see, are you actually delivering something better than what your competitor does, right? Does your integration need 10 steps and your competitor needs only five steps, right? Uh, is it because the way you've written the doc or is it just you have many endpoints? Uh, so, you know, those are the sort of conversation that would never happen if you would never start with the integration guide uh, to begin with. Uh, the other thing it does amazingly well is you get feedback early, right? No code written, not a lot of time spent it in PR reviews. You write the doc, you show it to your sales engineer, professional services, uh, whoever outbound teams that you have in the company and you get immediate feedback. So the, uh, the benefits are numerous. It depends uh, a lot on the size of your company, obviously. If you have a large company, I think you'll accrue more benefits. If it's a much smaller company, uh, the benefits can be limited because you're already working very collaboratively. But uh, you know, there, there is certainly a lot of things uh, that are good about this. And now some of the things it is not, right? It's, it's, it's important to call out what it is not. This isn't a replacement for integration guides that you write and publish on your on your portal when, when you have your APIs done and dusted, right? This is the beginning of it. You could leverage, I would say, all of it uh, towards building that, but this is not a replacement for your integration guide. This isn't, you know, some developers make it to be like, hey, we're just writing more uh, comments in a code. It's this is not really about that. It doesn't, uh, you know, take away the fact that you have to work, still work with your documentation team to write good integration guides written that you can publish. Uh, it isn't a substitute for test driven, behavioral driven read me driven. So there's other approaches that are complementary to this, but this, this has a very specific focus on 
really trying to work backwards from what a developer you would hand to a developer to integrate and then work backwards to doing the spec and the code. So it's 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 different in its its sense and hopefully this gives you an illustration of you know where are the things in which it's similar and where are things it's slightly different. Now we all go through this, right? And and you wonder, well, is this is this really right for me? Uh, when do you think is something like this going to be really useful? And uh, a prime candidate is, you know, you all go do your own thing, you know, and you have to come to a uh, an integration test sort of a, a timeline within your program, and you realize that you need to set up a war room because everyone has been sort of working in silos. Uh, and you really know understanding of how things are going to piece together, right? Um, uh, this happens quite a lot um, in big companies uh, because you're using for standard that's either already built, currently being built, or you're not even built. Right? So you're trying to marry uh, a bunch of things uh, that are really coming together. And the other uh, point is, you know, you're just hiring too many professional services, sales engineers, solution engineers, whatever you call it within your company to really help your product because all they're doing is writing custom documentation because your API strategy is um, you know, just all over the place, right? Um, so these are some of the reasons why you, know, you might want to choose this. You, know, you might also want to choose this is because look, you know, I've done everything by the book. I used to do everything code driven. I moved on to spec driven, but you know, my problems have been unchanged, right? That's the time to maybe investigate the strategy um, and see if it really works for you. Now, you know, every company has their API uh, product management process. Um, you know, I'm presuming at this point that most companies have, think of APIs as products and they use the same rigor that they use uh, when they build any products. And just because it's an API or an SDK, they don't try to do something different. So if you use a process like this, you know, it starts with discovery, design, development, and deploy and launch. What I'm really encouraging here is, you know, when you are in your design mode is when you think about trying to stand up some integration docs that can help you visualize the process end to end. Now, as I said before, this doesn't take away the fact that you need to still polish up your integration guides and do a whole bunch of things that you need to do to publish it. Uh, so you still have to do it towards the end of your program, but the idea of doing at least a few of them upfront is it sort of eliminates the risk that you introduce by leaving it out for too far too long, right? So that's, that's how it sort of fits into the end-to-end -end life cycle. Now, all of this is quite honestly not going to be really useful if you don't think of developers as customers. That's the genesis of this idea. You need to really embrace the idea that developers are your customers and that's the sort of persona that you're trying to build your product for. Because once you sort of embrace that idea, then you can start writing a doc considering that particular customer in mind. Right. So it's it's there's one thing that you know is is really important for a success of this is to think of developers as your customers, and it shouldn't stop there. Right. Um, you need to really peel the onion a little bit. You know, it's all developers are not equal. You know, uh, there was a time when I was told, oh, why don't you just do a survey of the developers within your team? Right. They're all developers, but that's that's certainly not the case because. When you try thinking about your product and think about the different personas, you know you might encounter scenarios where you know you might build a product, but you don't really need an API. Most of them really use an SDK uh, to code against, right? So what you're really offering your core product is like, look, you know, I'm I'm going after a base that just for some magical reason happens to use a PHP, right? And so then that becomes your crucial um, element. There could be others where you know they just need something to drop in, right? And they don't even need an API to start out with. And there could be others, as you see on the far right, which you know they're already integrated with the competitor. They just have everything set up on the back end to work. And so if they want to replace you with, with the competitor they have today, they just need 
things to work exactly or at least similar to what it does today because that's that's the way they are set up. So just having these different personas in mind, if you now imagine building for a, someone who is already integrated with your competitor and you know that's sort of a big market for you uh, because the market is maybe overly saturated, then you need to really think about integration from that perspective and then writing a guide can immediately change because then you have someone you can go and ask. They say, look, here are the five things you need to do to integrate. Does it gel well with how you do today? And that, that becomes a very, very smoother conversation. Now, here is a very simple template that uh, I tend to use. Um, it doesn't have to be like this. It could mimic the integration guide that you have today, but can you always start out with some sort of a goal or use case that you're trying to go after, right? And I work at PayPal, so it's always about to us accepting money um, or accepting PayPal. Uh, and you need to state some assumptions, right? So you need to you need to have a start for your integration. Guide. You could assume that, hey, look, I'm not going to talk everything about uh, you know the developer signing up to something. So you could just presume that sort of your assumption, that's your presumption before you get into the integration guide. And then from then on, what you try to do is start thinking about steps that you would ask someone to integrate, right? So this typically in most API programs is, you know, fetch an identity token, get an access token. There's a little blurb about what that means, you know, what the endpoint is, a little code snippet in curl, and then you move on to the next step, you know, get your access token, you know, use it to then display your PayPal button or, you know, anything that else, uh, make an API call. And you just lay it out, um, now, it doesn't have to be super detailed, or the point is, you know, you're putting enough to get the point across, right? And as you, as you see this, just imagine, no API written, no specs, but you're just imagining what that integration steps are going to look like much before everything is done. And you, now you have an actual document that you can go around and share. It's not going to be 100% perfect. You might change how you call your endpoint later on, or you might change a few field names. But the key here is to really de-risk the end-to-end -end integration step and not so much of the individual elements within it. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to call out is, is different between writing sort of a, a, a dogs driven and by that mean integration user guide in a design discovery phase as opposed to launch. Uh, the key goal is, you know, you're working backwards. Right, you're working backwards from what an end goal would be, and then bringing it forward, and that helps you do competitive analysis. That helps you get much feedback much earlier in the design discovery process, as opposed to launch, where you know you're really trying to get something published uh, with the aim of getting someone to do things self-serve. Right, at at the design discovery phase, things are low fidelity. You're not going through a whole lot of details. Uh, you know, you might have a few high-level endpoints in mind, but you don't have a complete API spec. You know, you wouldn't have things like a sequence diagram. Uh, you wouldn't have uh, an overview section that you might have in a in a guide that you publish it on. So uh, there are differences in in terms of fidelity and what you would do in a design discovery phase and in a launch phase. And sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error on what works in an organization, but. A model like this has worked for us very, very well. Uh, and you know, this sort of helps illustrate you know, what you would do then versus what you would do later on, because obviously a lot of information that's available at launch is far more detailed than when you start out with, but it, the advantages are still the same. Now, all of this quite honestly is, is easier said than done. Uh, you know, introducing something new within a company is always going to be challenging. And when uh, I remember starting out, uh, you know, the questions are always the same, right? Like how can you document that's not even built? You know, I just hate writing. I'm not a good writer. You know, nobody in my team wants to document, uh, you know, and why can't I just start coding? I think every sort of team, every organization goes through sort of these questions. Uh, and what I want you to, Think about this first, buy into some of the things that I, I told you and then prepare yourself uh, to answer this question. The answers depend on obviously the company that you work for. Uh, you know, you might start out with a trial group. You might start out with a program that's inherently very complex and you use this as a aid to 
reduce the complexity. But the key is, you know, as, as you embark on something new, like a, a docs driven or docs first development, you know, you would encounter these questions. And I would really encourage you to think about, you know, what does it mean? How would you answer them? Because then that sets the stage up for success. Otherwise, it's just easy to just go back to what you're doing today, right? And that could be doing spec, uh, hopefully, but if not, you know, just writing code and, and then doing the spec afterwards. So really encourage you to think about this because that will set you up for success. And uh, with that, um, you know, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I love the space and so would welcome anyone reaching out to me. You know, I have a Canonly link there, so just feel free to set some time up. Always want to talk about APIs and SDKs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Raul, for that brilliant talk. My first question for you is, do you use any specific document collaboration tools in your work? Well, I mean, we, we have our own uh, bunch of internal tools uh, like Confluence and, and Word, but typically I think, you know, feel free to use any collaborative tool. I think just make sure that it's you know, I can write a, a decent code snippet, right? I think things get really ugly in Word. So, you know, even uh, you know, putting things on GitHub in Markdown files is good. Uh, but something which both developers and non-developers can collaborate with, can show codes in a, in a decent manner, I think is a, is a tool to go with. Awesome, thank you. My next question for you is, are there any times where you don't try to use a document-driven API development effort? Yeah, I think you know, there's always going to be times for pragmatic reasons that you would not uh, tend to use it. You know, it could be that uh, you know you're building internal APIs or you're building an API that's you know just one endpoint, right? you're just fetching data. It's just can't, things. A lot of things cannot go wrong in it. Uh, I, I I still can't think of a reason why you would not do it because uh, even when I do this, I mentally do it in my head. The only difference is I don't write it. Right, so that's the only difference. So I think you might as well just write it, but there could be some obvious reasons why, you know, you might feel this is just not worth the trouble. Uh, and so, and, and everyone is on the same page. I think those are the only reasons why you would uh, not try to use it. Wonderful, thank you, Ivan. So next, you know, just thinking about every, all of the different people involved during the process um, of API development, how do you ensure that you know, those different stakeholders have buy-in to the process. Yeah, so I think when you're initializing the process or like let's say when you're bringing this up, I think the best way is to start small, right? Um, and, and try to uh, get everyone aligned to using it. But I think as, as the process matures and it becomes more institutionalized, I think you reach out to the same stakeholders that you hopefully reach out prior to deploying and launching your product, right? Which is, uh, working with your with your tech support or your sales engineers or solution engineers, anyone and everyone who uh, shows an integration guide to the end customer um, is really one you should really get a buy-in from. And the document is an amazing way to do it because, you know, if you have a good collaborative tool, you know, they can leave you feedback and say, hey, you know, this step looks really unnecessary and we shouldn't do it this way or you should do it the other way. And I think that's the whole point of it. Um, if you can imagine, just imagine doing the spec, doing the code, and you come six months later with the integration guide, and that's when people find out mistakes. It's really hard to roll back uh, all that effort. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Raul. Um, what's a what's a good place for people where people can reach you? You know, in case they have additional questions. Yeah, I think the best place to look me, uh, you know, I have a Calendly link on, on the slide or just look me up on LinkedIn and send me a message. I think that's just the best way to get hold of me.